Hey, uh, good afternoon. It's a panel on uh, mental health and professional athletes. His name's Charlie Moore. I'm uh, associated with the Cleveland Indians. Um, we have a panel here that's uh, outstanding. Why they're outstanding? Because they're people who walk the talk on mental health. Not people who talk about it. People who do it, have done it, and are going to continue to do it. And that's why I selected these people. People are not uh, in the fringes of mental health and professional sports. They're involved with it on a, a regular basis, including myself for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, and that's really changed over that time. So that's the panel. Myself, Chris uh, with the Indiana Pacers and Green Bay Packers, uh, Scott Goldman with the Dolphins, Ken Gunter with the N WNBA, NBA, Dwight Hollier is not here. Dwight is no longer associated with the NFL. Some of you may know he's uh, now at, at uh, Vice President for Stu uh, Student Athlete Wellness, I, I may that be the correct title, at the University of North Carolina, and, and Wendy Berlavi with the, with the Bulls. Okay, so that's the panel. And uh, what we're gonna do is, these are the kinds of questions I wanna address today. This is, a, this is not a research panel. This is a panel looking at the notion of practice in relation to professional athletes within the context of professional sports organizations in relation to mental health. Okay, so these are questions we're gonna address. Initially, I'm gonna ask each person just to, to make some overall overview comments about these questions. Um, and then we'd we'll like to open it up too for questions from the audience and some interaction. I know it's, it's re relative, sometimes difficult with the size or, or the room and so forth, but uh, some of the questions that w we believe are important, I believe are important, are what are priority needs of, pr of professional athletes in the mental health area. Not what intervention they need, that's a solution, but what should they be addressing? terms of the mental, emotional development and needs. So that's one area. Right, a lot of people are very quick on pulling the trigger with interventions, interventions out of context, interventions that are not based in social, cultural, linguistic, and ethnic con context. Oh, but they got some study over here on the side with a group of college students or pe clinical populations they think may generalize. All right, so we'll address that. Second is how can the mental health needs of professional athletes within their context be addressed effectively. Effectively means there's some meaning to it and they get some benefit out of it. Third is the, what's the readiness of professional sports organizations for mental health services? I'll address that briefly uh, as we start. Uh, fourth, how can mental skill services has to do with performance on the field in relation to preparation, competitiveness, making adjustments, keeping your mind a moment, moving on, uh, letting things go. How can that be effectively coordinated or productively coordinated with uh, mental health services? How can they be organized in that way? And it may be also, what are any implications for sports psychology training and practice? Now, the panelists are not gonna address these in a lockstep manner, right? But these are the kinds of questions that, that uh, we're gonna be talking about today uh, in relation to mental health with professional athletes in professional sports organizations in order to enhance the mental and emotional development of professional athletes in relation to performance and overall well-being. Okay, so with, with that said, uh, I, this is a conception, that, this is my own per per particular conception I use, I'm not saying you should use it, but it has to do with psychological and professional and social well-being within relevant context. And those of you who are involved in professional sports, there are many contexts <coughs> that are embedded in the life and the uh, career of professional athletes, no matter how short that might be. Now, Here's something I just want to briefly address and we'll go through the panel. Ready? I've been involved with professional sports for 30 years. I've been involved with organization of professional sports. And this is an area of concern of mine. About, I'm not just talking about, I'm not talking about the Cleveland Indians, I'm not talking about M Major League Baseball, I'm not talking about NBA or any, but these are some factors that I'd just like to briefly elaborate on that deal with uh, 
the readiness of an organization. Where did this come from? It's just not a research panel, but there's a research base for this, some of my own. These factors, uh, if, if they're, they're measured appropriately, will discrim discriminate between organizations that have been successful in implementing programs and services from those that are, have not been doing that. Okay, so I'll briefly li like to mention that again, not from a research context, if you want to know more about that, I can provide information on that, but from practice. All right, so let's take the first one, to start. Ability of an organization, sports organization, in this case a professional sports organization, to commit resources. One of my research personnel, information, facilities, and funds, among other things. Right? So there's some organizations will talk a good game, they like you know, mental health, la la la, uh, but they're not re willing to commit resources. Or the resources they commit are very, very narrow, very, very small, uh, and very, very disjointed. Uh, on the other hand, there are some organizations who are bought into the importance of mental health and are willing to put their uh, money and funds where their mouth, and resources where their mouth is. The second one, but second factor has to do with values. In this case, the value of the organization towards a, the athlete as a performer and person, okay? Performer on the field. In, in our organization, we, you know, in our own programs that we provide to athletes or, or players and so on, which is gone now, we, we like to say that baseball is what you do, but it's not who you are. All right, that's very, very important. And some organizations have a, value that. They have a history, they have a tradition of that. Uh, others don't. Uh, the idea, mental health, what does that mean? Why we, when we talk about mental health services, uh, where are those services provided, when, by whom? Uh, circumstances of the organization, the organizations that are stable in terms of their leadership, front office leadership, executive leadership, uh, are more likely to uh, and assuming those other factors they, they score high on are likely to, uh, to buy into uh, some mental health services and programs. Not as, not as outsource, not outsource. I'm talking about programs that are embedded in the routine of the organization. Not where you have some outsourcing of stuff and, uh, which, which I might talk about outsourcing is good or bad, but it has to do with embedding it in, in that context, understanding that context. The timing, for services delivery, I think this is time is right at, at any, in any professional sport uh, for mental health services. I could say that for collegiate too, and a lot of these factors will also apply at the collegiate level too, although today we'll just be talking about them at the uh, professional level. The obligation, O, oh, of those in the organization to make mental health a priority. That's a, maybe a tough one. Who's really obligated? By obligated, I mean not talking, not attending a meeting, not, not getting some public uh, hearing or something like that, but obligated in terms of following through the commitment payment. When the things are going difficulty, they're willing to follow through on it. Resistance, resistance occurs in anything, but who's gonna resist that? Uh, resistance because uh, players or coaches or some are concerned about confidentiality or about uh, the really authenticity of the organization to do something that may benefit the player. And of course, the last one there, the why, is the yield. Uh, the yield for, uh, that can result from uh, providing uh, mental health services that have an evidence base of some kind. So I, I'm just presenting that because it, that may, that this might also be used as a basis for discussion. Doesn't have, I'm not pushing these factors, but I'm doing this more and more over time. I find these to be very, very, very important. I'd just like to make some other brief comments before I turn it over to our, our group here. Uh, and I said, this, these are the people who walk the talk. This is not bullshit up here. These are people who are professionally involved in what they're doing, all right? Not on the fringes. For, for myself, I mean, the, the areas of concern I've found over, over the course of time with professional athletes are really no different than uh, other areas that have to do with, you know, when you look at categories, categories having to do with depression, anger, loneliness, and isolation anxiety and stress. Those are some areas of uh, mental health domains of concerns that I have found. Sources of mental health problems or difficulties to me have to do with things in the professional level, have to do with job performance, 
who's making those judgments, job security, relatively short, uh, loss of identity, uh, if you're not playing, particularly if you get injured, you're in rehab, and uh, the, the, the loss of social connections with people other than the people you're, you're dealing with on a regular basis. I think there's some factors that uh, impede mental health service delivery, in my, in my opinions. First, as most prof many professional athletes, the reluctance to uh, admit weakness, you know, particularly in, in men's sports. You know, we don't, we don't, we're not weak, we got to tough it out. You know, all that bullshit. Tough it out, all that stuff. All right? Difficulties finding professional help. Yeah, so well, there's a lot of people around, yeah, but it's very difficult if you have an athlete who's very, very guarded. Uh, where's the professional help coming from? Internally, externally? And then uh, others, the organizational readiness, which I just uh, uh, addressed. Now, sources, of course, for professional uh, uh, athlete support are many, spouses, significant others, family members, team members, possible religious organizations, uh, professional counselors, and team support staff. So that's, those are some things I think are very, very important. Now, again, what I said well, could also apply at the collegiate level, particularly in the, uh, you know, at the, at the Division I type of level. But we'll address that here. So what I'm going to do is start off with Chris. Chris will make some comments. And then, uh, you know, we can go down the line and uh, make some comments and then uh, we'll go from there. So you start with the oldest, right? Is that okay. the plan? You start with the oldest? Well, yeah, you just happen to be there. He's, he's the lead. We're, we're, we're playing right now. I just came in from Houston. I'm going to go right back there. But uh, he's a, he's a leadoff man. Leadoff man's got to get everybody on base. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, um, it's great to see folks here on the very last session of ASP. That's always kind of a, a fun session to be uh, part of as you see people with suitcases coming into the room. That's always an enjoyable piece. <laughs> For context, um, just so everyone kind of knows a little bit about my background, my background is um, was a collegiate football athlete, was a graduate assistant football coach. I thought it, when I was in graduate school I was going to be a coach. Um, got a master's degree in counseling psychology. Worked in the addictions field for four years in adolescent addictions before making the decision to go back and study and become a sports psychologist. My PhD is in counseling psychology, but I did my doctoral minor in sport and exercise psychology. Um, and it was kind of the first time it had ever been proposed at the university, and it was, I knew I wanted to work with athletes as a psychologist, much like physicians who were doing sports medicine fellowships, worked in athletics and sports medicine. I just felt like that was kind of my pull and my path. And, um, and I've been fortunate that I've had that opportunity since that time to just work in the field of athletics. Um, so my first professional experience was in 1994 as a team psychologist for the Arizona Cardinals. And if any of you know Buddy Ryan and know any stories about Buddy Ryan, he would be probably the last person on the list of NFL coaches that you would think would have a psychologist for their team. Buddy hired me sight unseen. He knew I had worked with Washington State University's football program. And the day I met him was the chat about confidentiality. That's always fun. When I told coach, and Buddy is, you know, at that time was an intimidating human being, um, but I'd worked in addiction, so, you know, I could have worked with a hard population. I was okay with that. Um, I told Buddy, I said, you know, coach, I have to have confidentiality with the athletes. He turned around in his chair and looked at me and he said, I don't want to know who the hell you're talking to. The reason I have you here is because the issues you help them with are the things that get them out of football. So even back then, there were individuals that understood what mental health is about and what those resources were. So it was, it was really kind of a blessing, and I've been fortunate in over many, many years since that time to be in those environments. I work at St. Vincent Sports Performance, which is in Indianapolis, Indiana. That's where I'm employed. And uh, since that time, I worked with the Columbus crew for four years. Um, from 96 to 2000. I was trying to write this down and my handwriting gets scribbly. I was with the Kansas City Royals from 1999 to 2005 as their consulting psychologist. That's where I met Charlie and have just delighted and very much enjoyed his collegial uh, friendship. 
And I started in the NBA in 2008 with Oklahoma City. And then in 2011, started working with the Indiana Pacers, which is a much easier commute. And I just starting my eighth season as the Indiana Pacers team psychologist. I'm committed to 120 days of service with the organization. And then this past summer, I was hired by the Green Bay Packers as their consulting sports psychologist. In both of my positions with the Pacers and the Packers, one of my job descriptions is to coordinate the mental health resources for the organization. So I work closely with the head athletic trainer, the head team physician in both settings to create kind of outreach resources. We're not going to be able to attend to all the issues, but it is, I feel, my responsibility to coordinate who is our psychiatrist, who is our neuropsychologist, who is our marriage and family therapist, who is our pastoral care provider, who are the resources that our student athletes can utilize, or our athletes. That's my college environment, I get stuck with the student athlete. Um, and so part of my role as the team performance psychologist is to educate about performance psychology, but at the same time talk about mental health as a performance issue. And I wanna be very clear philosophically, I do not separate into a silo performance enhancement and clinical issues. To me, it's a continuum. I'm dealing with a human being in my office. Everything is about performance at this level. Everything. Relationships, family, parenting, mood, dealing with injury. In both the Pacers and Packers organization, working with me is not a, it's not an option if you have an injury that requires surgery or a significant time away. It's part of the process, it's part of the care. And so one of the things that I wanted to comment, I think as we talk about this topic of mental health, the degree to which you're integrated with the performance staff is essential. I think there's a, a kind of a, a feeling out there that psychology should kind of be out in the community, away from the building, and I think that further stigmatizes the issue. There's nothing better for me that my office location in the Pacers training complex is in the hallway from the player locker room to the weight room to the training room. They walk by it every time they go to practice or to treatment. Same way with the Packers now where we're trying to I have kind of an off the path office and we're talking about remodeling. So my, my goal is to be out, be in the training room, be visible and be a resource. But the players all understand that part of my contract, both with the Pacers and the Packers, is confidentiality. So I'm doing right now my license in Wisconsin. I'm licensed in Indiana as a psychologist. So I'm going through the Wisconsin licensure process right now, even though the state statutes allow me to practice 60 days in the state of Wisconsin on my Indiana license. I just have a different moral compass or ethical compass that I go by. I think if I'm gonna practice in that, environment and I'm going to be licensed by the other clinicians. So it's really clear that, you know, I think those of us in this position, and I know Charlie put some great questions together today, shared, athletes have unique stressors, they have different stressors, but I've not found in my experience that they're less stressed than other populations or professions. The care provided, however, Providers need to understand the cultural competency of athletics. They need to understand this world. And unfortunately for a lot of us, I think the tough part is unless you're trained or have experience and opportunity, it's hard to kind of know how you walk into that culture and how you are being presented. And I, you know, everyone finds their own style. I do things kind of my way and I'm comfortable with it. And uh, they always say, well, how do you measure your efficacy? You get hired another year. Players speak on your behalf. The GM values your role with the coaches. The coach sees your role as a support and respects your confidentiality. And that's part of an educational process. It's part of establishing boundaries. It's all of the things that I learned being trained as a counseling psychologist, just applying it in this world of sport. So for me, you know, it's, it's just been such a unique journey for the past, I, I attended my first ASP 30 years ago and um, as a student and it was you know such a great place for me to kind of dialogue and connect to other folks but now you know we sit here and talk and here's a few of us here and the reality we're dealing with is only about 60 percent 70 percent of NBA teams have a designated person I don't even think it's that much and NFL is probably not even half NFL has a clinician at every team 
a clinician in the community or a team employed? So most of the NFL contracts, but they do have a designated clinician that is assigned to every team specifically for one program. And I can say more about that, but they have yeah, resources the available to the team and their families. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a good player development staff person, then you're going to have resources. And that's where I came in through the Packers to work with him in developing that. So again, it's the idea of how do we coordinate our role? One of the things I wanted to make sure is that we are on the same page and in the same kind of relationship to these uh, teams as the sports medicine providers, strength conditioning staff. I think that's kind of where my best fit has been as part of this performance team. So um, I'm just going to move it on. Who's going next, Charlie? All right. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through uh, Scott. Go, oh, go Wendy. Ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Wendy. We'll, we'll just go down the line. We'll just go down the line. You're down the line. You're welcome. All right, Wendy, and then, you know, and Wendy will make some comments. And after that, we'll open up a qu we'll have time for questions. So Her we're not trying to keep the questions higher. out. We're trying to keep the questions in once you hear it. Go ahead. So my name is Wendy Ballaby, and I am, oh, I work for the Chicago Bulls. My, my title is performance coach, which I chose because I didn't want psychology in the title at the time. So I've been with them going into my third season reason why I didn't want that in the title is because they didn't have anybody and so it was a very new position um, they didn't even know what it was that they wanted when they hired me and that's exactly what they said we don't know what the position is we don't even know what you're gonna be doing but we want it to be you so um, I chose to do performance coach just to um, ingratiate myself a little easier with the players and with the coaches uh, prior to that I was with the Olympics so with for so did two winter and a summer Olympics and then prior to that I was at James Madison University and I was there for four years and started the program there, which is now run by Bob Harmison. <coughs> so with the Bulls, um, mental health, the way that I look at it with our players, so our oldest player, our veteran, is 28. Exactly. Um, so I chose this season to look at their mental health and their performance in a way of more of education about life because there are things that they just do not know. They have not developed a sense of identity. The only identity is a basketball player. And so those of you know from your know, research, if you're an African-American, that is not a very great thing is that's your only identity, right? So I wanted to help them develop a sense of identity. I wanted to educate them about just life, um, doing a series of, of, of discussions, one of them being social justice. That's where we're gonna start. I'm actually bringing in um, Rashida Ali, which is one of Muhammad Ali's twins' daughters. She's gonna come and talk about what he did in the rink and then what he did outside the rink. Interesting enough, several of our players do not know who Muhammad Ali is. So when I say that they're young, I mean they're really young. So much less they don't know who he is, so they don't even know the history of what he did um, with social justice. They think that Colin Kaepernick was the first athlete to ever do anything. So I want to educate them on this is actually not something new for athletes, thinking that at some point, they're gonna to have to make some kind of a stand, some kind of a, not say speech, but they're gonna be asked some kind of a question in the media, and I kind of feel like they need to know what they're talking about. So we're gonna start with social justice. We're gonna talk about, are you even registered to vote? What does that even mean? Do you need to vote? How does that, so we're going way back. We're gonna have a thing about equality. So my focus is that I want to, again, help them learn about who they are as a people, help them develop a sense of identity, and talking with the coaches, we feel like that also help build a sense of team. So they're not only just getting to know who they are on the court, but also getting to know each other outside of the court. So that's what these discussions are, are meant to, to do, is to bring the team together as human beings. Um, and then we'll see in the, the, you know, the positive on the court. That's the, the idea, right? Um, but the, my experience with the, with the Bulls is the mental health piece is, is continually to grow the NBA I, which I think some of you has, have heard that they partnered with the MBPA to develop a position which Bill Parham has now, but that has been split. So now the MBPA has Bill Parham and the NBA has their own position and they've brought folks together trying to figure that out. And what Chris was saying, about 60 or 70 percent of the um, teams may have somebody designated in that meeting. I, I would definitely say less than. There were a lot of athletic trainers and player development people because the team did not have anybody at all. So I would probably say 30 or 40, you were there, yeah. they, they may have somebody. And, and this is going to be someone that's, uh, as a consultant, this isn't somebody that's in-house. There was, I'm going to say, five people in-house through the whole NBA. 
So the MBA is a little behind, trying to help them catch up on, on the mental health piece, but they definitely think that there's a need, definitely want to be more informative, and I think that's one of the things that we should do as, as ASK is, is help them understand exactly who it is they need to hire and what those credentials are. Well, that's some pretty impressive stuff you guys both have going on. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I can contribute, but uh, <laughs> it, it's um, Lauren Michaels had this great line about uh, immigrants coming to the United States. They were promised that the streets were paved with gold, and when they got here, not only were the streets not paved with gold, but they weren't even paved. And then they said, "Go pick up a shovel. You got to go pave the roads." So. I'd like to just take a moment because I see some people in the room and stuff that have been paving the way to give me the opportunity to do what I've been doing. So I'm just really grateful for uh, all the folks that have pioneered and I think these four up here are, are definitely pioneers. So I'm, I'm just really honored and grateful to be here with you guys and, and also the people in the room that, that, did, that really did some heavy lifting and paving the way for, for a guy like me. Um, my user story kind of starts at the Albert Ellis Institute, so I, maybe one step back. I uh, have two PhDs, one's in clinical psychology, one's in school psychology, which is like getting two PhDs for the price of two PhDs. <laughs> and then I did, uh, I did some advanced training in exercise science and kinesiology just because two PhDs wasn't enough, and I was like, I'll go across the street to the kines department and ask what kinds of classes I could take while I'm here which is also a level of stupidity. But um, so while I was at the Albert Ellis Institute, I, I wrote a, a, a pamphlet that they distributed called uh, Using Rational Motive Behavior Therapy for Arousal Regulation in Sport. Albert Ellis wanted to change the title to Arousing Yourself with REBT, which I thought might have sold more pamphlets, but maybe been a lot more disappointing. Uh, I went from there to St. Louis University where I was their sports psychologist. Uh, transitioned to the University of Arizona, where I was there for about eight years. Participated in a lot of NCA initiatives, including uh, co-authoring or participating in, in writing the uh, the best practices guideline that went out and was distributed to all the athletic departments. That really talked about the full spectrum of care that that Chris dialogued about. Um, after Arizona, I became the director of performance psychology and athletic counseling at the University of Michigan. And if that wasn't enough stuff going on on the side, I, I developed a test called uh, the Athletic Intelligence Quotient, which just measured sports-specific intelligence um, based off the Cattell horn carroll theory of intelligence. So um, that actually kind of led to a lot of the pro gigs was the AIQs being used by all these teams. And while we were dialoguing about those results, it, it was always interesting. They, you know, we'd be talking about the AIQ scores, and then they would go for lunch, and they're like, well, Doc, while we got you, what do you think about this issue, or what do you think about that issue? And so now I'm at a place where um, some teams are going, well, we kind of want you around more because of the lunch conversation as much as the AIQ conversation. And so the Miami Dolphins were the first to do that last year, and they just said, hey, can you just be around? So I went to five games and went to OTAs and offseason and whatnot. And then in February, our head coach, he said, I'd, I'd like you to be around more. And, uh, and really complimentary, I was blown away. He's like, I'd like you to be around more. We're better when you're around. Maybe that's just uh, correlational, not causational, but I'll take it. So I gambled and I said, I can't do that. It's always a gamble to say no to a head football coach. The gamble always is if you say no and they really want it, you can kind of write your own, you can write your own check. So I said no, I had a day job. He said that wasn't his problem. I said, provide a solution. He said, what do you want? I told him the years, I told him the number. He gave it to me. I told Michigan it was been really nice knowing them and I wish them the best of luck. And then I started working for the Miami Dolphins, which was interesting because it included full benefits, like it was an embedded position. I had full benefits including NFL pension and Roger Goodell had, yeah, someone just went, ooh, NFL pension. Yeah, NFL pension is kind of a big deal. Uh, and just to expound on my own stupidity or, or willingness to, to jump off a cliff without wings, um, about two months into it, uh, Coach Gase's close personal friend, uh, Matt Patricia, was hired by the, my, by the Detroit Lions. 
and they were dealing with some stuff. And, and so uh, they reached out to me because I still lived in Ann Arbor. And again, because the NFL rules and regulations, I can't work for another team without them asking permission. So Matt Patricia asked Adam Gase, it was like two neighbors saying, can I borrow a cup of sugar? Um, <laughs> So I went over and did some stuff for the Lions, and they said, hey, this is kind of cool. Can you do this? So can we do more of this? And I said, well, you got to talk to my employers, at which point the two head coaches said, well, and now instead of it being two neighbors borrowing a cup of sugar, it became almost like fifth graders dreaming of getting a puppy. They were like, you can have them Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'll have them Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and every other Sunday we'll split. So. I had to give up my benefits, including pension, and uh, ended up signing two contracts, one's with the Lions, one's with the Dolphins. And that was a really, if you've ever had to negotiate with a GM as a psychologist, it's really like not even bringing a knife to a gunfight, it's just going in there being like, so you negotiate contracts for a living and I just wanna help people. This doesn't seem like a good outcome, but uh, I sat at the table with the vice president of the Dolphins and the GM of the Lions <laughs> and said, how are we gonna do this? The beautiful thing is I got week seven off. They're playing each other. So I was like, hey, I negotiated a paid vacation. I thought that was kind of nice. Um, but right now, so um, this week's a Detroit Lion week. Next week will be a Dolphin week, and it just goes back and forth every other week, though both seem to call uh, whenever they want. And then um, I also signed a contract with an NBA team, but. Thankfully, that's just more like a retainer consultation gig. So they just call me whenever they want, and I fly out there once a month. And then there's another NBA team that has asked me to do uh, uh, the combine, where I interview athletes for, uh, for just assessment. So um, if you were to ask, what does my day look like? I, it, every time I walk in the building, I'm never totally sure. And if I look at my calendar, sometimes it in the morning it looks pretty empty and then by the end of the day around 11 o'clock at night I'm pretty exhausted. Um, if someone were to say kind of as Chris pointed out is this mental health initiatives and needs or is this performance I, I, whatever's in front of me I guess I just try to do whatever I can to make the boat row faster um, which one story that I just wanted to include because because um, another colleague of ours that works with a Major League Baseball team said, Scott, don't go out there and tell them like all the glitz and glamour of the job. Like tell them like how hard it is and all that and just be real with them, be authentic. Because some of these younger younger professionals that want to get into this think that like the first thing they do is, you know, go in and sit down with the head coach and dial. So uh, just one quick anecdote and, and really Charlie Mars, my inspiration to this story is um, you know, week one, I was on the sidelines, and the uh, and I'm just kind of hanging out, absorbing. And uh, the equipment guy said, "Hey, Doc, can you come over here real quick?" And I was like, "Sure." He's like, "Hold this, high, whatever makes the boat roll faster." So Charlie once gave this advice. He's like, "Look, if if the floors need to be mopped, mop the floors. Like, if you need to pass out water, like you want the, the whole goal is to be part of a system where we're always." pushing it forward, like just make the boat row faster, make the boat, like whatever you can do, you know, shine shoes, whatever it takes. So I was like, yeah, I'll hold the towel. So I'm holding this towel and I'm watching the game. And then I looked over just to, out of curiosity, why am I holding the towel? Sure enough, the, the quarterback needed to urinate. So I was like, oh, so this is, this is what we're doing, right? So, um, you know, you gotta block it from the screen so that way we don't miss any time. Cause imagine a turnover or something happens, the quarterback's gotta go in if he's in the locker room. So, you know, I, finished and I just I didn't shake the quarterback's hand but I did kind of pat him on the back and said well, well I guess we'll always have that moment and uh, he laughed and and I think this is the kind of stuff that we do is we just build relationships with people and then when they come to us whether it's a time of need or an optimization um, there's a level of authenticity to it so I guess that's my user story um, so I guess I'm the closer on this panel um, nice uh, so again, my name is Kenza Gunter. Um, by trade, I am a licensed psychologist. Um, I'm also a certified consultant, and I, I'll kind of take you through what positions I have and a little bit about how I got there, but I'll also talk to you a little bit about some of the movements within the leagues around some of this. Um, 
So first job was working in a counseling center as an outreach coordinator, um, not really working with athletics, but because I had the background in athletics, wanted some services, I began to be the liaison um, to athletics in my role as, as outreach coordinator. And so after that, that was kind of my foundation. After that, went into private practice. Um, and over the last five years have arrived to the point where I am right now. So full-time private practice, um, if anybody asks me, that's what I do. And from that, I consult in a number of different places. So um, I have the opportunity to consult with Georgia Tech's athletic department, which is a division one um, collegiate program in Atlanta. Um, I also have the opportunity to work with the Atlanta Falcons as their team clinician. I'm currently in season six with them. Um, I work with the Atlanta Hawks as well, and I'm in season three with them. And I work with the Atlanta Dream, which is our WNBA team. Um, and I just completed season two with them. Um, I'm not full-time embedded anywhere. I work full-time for myself, and I just happen to have the opportunity to work with some really cool organizations that are in Atlanta. So in my role with um, the Falcons, I was initially brought in. Uh, the NFL has a what we call a rookie success program. It's since been called a rookie transition program. The purpose of it is to provide psychoeducational workshops um, to the rookies to help them orient not only to the league, but also to the specific team and club in which they're part of. And so those workshops consist of 45 minutes to an hour long presentations about a number of different things, stress management, time management, relationships. We bring in someone to talk about financial education. That happens during the course of the season, as well as right after the draft. And so initially I was brought in to facilitate those workshops um, and did that for a couple of seasons. And, and in being there, gaining trust with the organization, having visibility amongst the coaches, the players. Um, I now have the opportunity to still facilitate those workshops, but also serve as a resource to anyone in the building, coaches, veterans, rookies, staff, whomever may need services. Again, I'm not in a full-time capacity, so it really is on an as-needed basis. I go up about once or twice a week to the facility, and then if others want to meet with me, I can go up, or they can come to my private practice office. Um, I think there really is an awareness of the need to provide mental health resources. And I'll say for all of the positions, when people were looking for someone, they were looking for a clinician. Um, and, and they were looking for a clinician to address the mental health piece. And the fact that I had the performance piece as well was a bonus. Now I know for some sitting in the room that may be like, but wait, we're at a sports psychology conference. What does that mean for us? Um, and what I think it means is that we have to realize even in our capacity as performance consultants, we need to be knowledgeable about mental health. That's not to say you need to be able to treat mental health, but you need to be knowledgeable about it and have a collection or a network of professionals around you who you can refer to if needed. Because in thinking about you know, what my colleagues have said, working with the whole athlete, just working with performance is not necessarily working with the whole athlete. And even again, if you don't want to work with mental health, because some people don't, you do need to know professionals in your area so that you can refer and have a network for yourself so that you can provide that service. Because providing the service doesn't mean you do the work, but you might connect them to a person who can help them, right? And so. Um, that's just a little caveat. So in my work with the um, Atlanta Hawks, which is our NBA team, um, my role has expanded with them as well. Um, just recently, uh, we finished training camp, and as a part of that, they brought in myself and our team psychiatrist to provide a mental health 101 kind of intro meeting to the team and the performance staff. And when we say performance staff, we're talking about athletic trainers, strength and conditioning, nutritionists, um, and, and the coaches, that's kind of who the performance staff includes. And having the opportunity to talk to them about what mental health is, and it's not just distress, but mental health is a continuum. So when things are going well, that's your mental health too, because I think everybody kind of all instantly goes to the problematic side and, and when there's a concern or a crisis, but helping them understand that we all fall on the mental health continuum every day. It's just a matter of what's going on and where we fall. So providing that education to help them understand how we can be a resource, not just in bad times, but throughout the course of their experience um, with the club. Um, and I think that's a really big point of distinction because when they hear that, then they know well, I don't just need to come to you when things are going wrong. You don't become stigmatized or associated with problems. Because if they think the only time I see you is when there's a problem, the only time I'm expected to talk to you is when there's a problem, then I don't want to talk to you because maybe you're creating these problems, right? Like, I don't want to come to you just when I have a problem. And so being around, being visible, being accessible, walking in and talking to them about the college football games that happened last week really helps to develop that relationship and that trust that allows them to then use you when they really are needing services. 
Um, and with the WNBA, it's similar as well, kind of going in on an as-needed basis. The WNBA is very interesting, though, and, and I don't think um, we talk about them nearly enough because as female professional athletes, they have some different things that they have to consider and some different realities. Um, one, their season is shorter and their pay is much less. And so generally what you will have is players participate in the WNBA league, which goes from about late April until maybe September, but then most of them go abroad and stay for a majority of the year where they are playing their full seasons because that's where they get the better pay. And so thinking about the mental health needs, domestically we think about what the needs are, but if you think about domestic needs and then what happens when I go abroad for six or seven months and I may be the only American on my team, I may not speak the language of the city in which I'm located, um, but I'm expected to perform and play. My support system is not here. I'm not sure what my living situation is going to look like, not sure if I'll have transportation, and yet I'm supposed to perform and thrive and be the star on the team. <laughs> um, that's a really different kind of mental health demand and need that, that's required. And so helping them to prepare for that trip um, becomes a really big, important part of the work that we do. Um, identifying resources that may be available where they in the countries where they're located, if there are resources available. Um, sometimes they have uh, counselors, American counselors there who can be of service to them, but sometimes they don't. And so it's trying to develop a coping skill toolbox that they can use while they're gone, and if they have a break and are able to come back to the States, it's connecting with them when they get here. Um, but that's just a unique experience for a professional athlete that I don't think we talk much about. The other group that I don't think we talk a whole lot about is the G League, which is the NBA's developmental league. And so when we think about the NBA, we think about the traditional NBA cities and all the athletes that are there, but there are a host of athletes in the G League that are in places that have very limited resources. For example, the Hawks G League team is located in Erie, Pennsylvania. There's not a lot in Erie, but this is a group of athletes who are dealing with constant transition. They could play a game one night, be on a plane that same night, be back in Atlanta or in a different city playing and stay there for two weeks and live out of their suitcase and be back in Erie or in the team where the team, the, the next city where the team is playing. And they're constantly navigating transition and uncertainty. And that's one of the mental health concerns too. I mean, people have talked about identity and transition into leagues and out of leagues, but managing the constant uncertainty that comes with being a professional athlete is also a different kind of mental health demand that we have to navigate. And certainly it can manifest as anxiety, um, classic anxiety, but really just kind of think about for the, for the rookie coming in for NFL season, for example, they come in in May, and what they've done at that point is you've arrived here to have an interview because you still don't have a job yet, all right? And so you're here all summer, maybe, if you don't get cut, and then you come back for training camp, and you're still applying for a job. You still have not gotten a job yet because there's 93 people on this roster and we've got to cut it down to 53 and then we'll add 10 back for a 63-man roster with our practice squad. But you don't know if you're going to be in that. And so let's say you make that 53-man roster in that six, or that practice squad and now you're in the season. But from week to week, you could get cut. We've seen that this year in Atlanta a lot with the injuries that we've had and players being cut and it wouldn't necessarily go like that. So managing the uncertainty of I don't know where I'm going to be from day to day and week to week is a real um, um, issue that we have to help them manage and help them tolerate that discomfort, right? Because they're, it's not only them, but they're taking care of their families as well. So um, th those are some of the things that I do in terms of league's openness to mental health services. Again, I think with athletes speaking out publicly, we've seen that a lot in the last several months. That has brought awareness, I think, to more people and it has made it a situation where um, there is an increased recognition that we need to address this. We need to have resources in place to address this. And so, as Wendy mentioned, um, the NBA PA just hired a position in the league. On the league side, they're also trying to make sure that there are clinicians identified in each NBA city. Again, still working with the G League and trying to figure that out, but to have the resource available. Um, for the NFL, each team has a designated clinician that facilitates the rookie programs um, and also that is available to the team or they have other uh, providers in the community that they utilize for any clinical needs that the team may have. Um, the NFL also has what they call the NFL Lifeline. It's a 24-hour crisis number that any player can use at any time to, if they're in crisis to, to reach someone and that's a confidential, it's funded by the NFL, but it's a confidential and separate service. So that's also a resource that's available to them. Um, 
And, and I just think that it's, uh, the stigma is still there, but it's decreasing. The more we can recognize we're working with people, the more they can recognize that we as providers are people. Um, I think that helps. And the more that you're visible, the more that the organization is willing to invest resources and to support you being there to increase that buy-in. I think it's um, just another way to really put that treating the whole person um, into practice. One of the things I say that if you have a, if you have a healthy person, you'll have a healthy athlete. Um, and athletes are people first. And so if we can remember that and communicate that, I think that allows us to be able to help them in this space and help to destigmatize seeking help in this space when they need to. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, just want to, first of all, I want to thank each panel me member here for their uh, <clears throat> genuine uh, report on, on what they do, how they do it, how they view mental health in relation to uh, performance. To me, there were three things that I got from, from what these people said, the very basic things. One is the r relationship, the in inextricable link between performance and personal development. You know, they're, 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 these are not separate things. They're, inte they're integrated, uh, dealing with the uh, performance. Deal, you deal with the athlete as a person. You deal with the athlete as a person. You do. So that's one thing. The second thing, uh, the theme has to do with the notion of relationships. The, uh, those are my words that we used. Relating to a range of people in that organization, athletic training, nutrition, massage therapists, strength and conditioning, uh, a range of you know, coaching staff, other support staff members. Um, very, very important. And of course, the range of athletes. So relationship, without relationships at the professional level, take a hike, because you're not going to be allowed to enter that system. An athlete, professional, and I'm speaking from working for years in the WNBA with San, San Antonio, NBA, many teams, NFL, number of teams, and NBA, that an athlete in, in 10 seconds can size you up about who you are, what you stand for, uh, how comfortable you are in dealing with them, so relationships. And lastly, the, uh, <laughs> the importance of context. You know, in professional sports, the environment is not error variance. You don't factor that out in some kind of algorithm or equation. It's very, very important. Cultural, linguistic, ethnic, uh, level of performance, and, and, and other, other cultural factors, organizational uh, readiness, so forth. So those are some things. Now, we have 21 minutes <laughs> left. That's perfect. You're here. <laughs> Want to make sure that you have a chance to ask questions or make comments or whatever. And I would, from past experience, I would say that most of the questions, 99.7% of them, will be relevant questions. Now, I don't know about the other three, but most will be 99, so, so feel free to address, step up and ask questions. There's microphones around here. Uh, address them to either any panel member, whatever. So why don't you start? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate all your perspectives very much. Uh, my name is Brent Hogarth. I'm a postdoctoral um, fellow at Lehigh University, working with, in the counseling center there with students and student athletes. Um, I say that just because I love the position that you're all engaged in, and at the end of this, this position, I'll be hopefully connecting in some regard, and maybe my name will ring a bell to this, this, this point here, this moment. Um, so my question is in regard to the different relationship that clinical psychologists, sports psychologists play compared to athletic trainers, coaches, and the different mentality. and a relationship that one develops with the with the athletes and I'll, I'll paint a picture to kind of uh, nurture this question so I was in a presentation the other day at the end of the workshop an athlete said you know this was kind of an inconvenient would have been good to have this on on the weekend and the athletic trainer says life is fucking inconvenient step up and as a psychologist working with the athlete I may have said that in a different way um, and I don't want to split myself from the, from the trainers, from the coaches, and I don't want to be perceived as 
for lack of better words, soft or not developing positive growth or post uh, growth mindset in that regard. And so I'm wondering in your experiences, um, how do you work with different, men, um, different ways of engaging in, in, in developing kind of grit and resilience and, and not being seen as soft so the coaches won't want you part of the, the, the team the co in, and, but to not split. Sorry, I know I was a little worried there, but any feedback from, from anyone in, in regard to that question would be valued. Thank you. I've never been described as soft. I didn't, so I I didn't think so, <laughs> sir. I didn't think so. I've uh, described you as soft. But are you, but are you yelling and, and screaming to the players no. about t toughening the fuck up? No, I think, I think what happens, unfortunately, in our field a little bit is we have to oversell, and that yeah. just doesn't fit with me. The way, <clears throat> the way that I interact with a team, so um, last week in our training camp, uh, about day three of the Pacers training camp, you know, they, the first night they have a team dinner, they introduce all the support staff, and then team, uh, um, after day three, I do an introductory session. And it was, it was really interesting this year because one of the things I talk about is what sports psychology is, what it isn't. Um, it can't be done to you. You have to be engaged. Um, the, last year, Nate McMillan, our head coach, mandated that every player meet with me once a month, at least. He said, I don't care if you talk about the weather or have a cup of coffee. And as some players found out, if I asked how they were doing on the bus, that counted as a session. Because not the first year, they're not getting fined because of me. So, but what it did is it opened the door. It made it okay for them to come in. And when I was getting ready to do my presentation this year, um, one of our players that's a utilizer stood up before I started nice. and talked about his experience and, and said to the players, especially in a roster that has three new free agents, here's how he helped me. And I'm always embarrassed. I don't but at the same time, it feels valued. These players get it. They understand it. And I've watched this change over years. More and more players are coming into professional sports and have had some experience with sports psychology, either in their collegiate programs or maybe through AAU ball or you know whatever program they come to. So they're not unfamiliar with it. Right. Last year's articles um, by Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan really created a forum. And we had an off day in Philadelphia. Uh, I was traveling with the team. I travel about half of the games. And uh, the head coach asked, do you want to talk to him, Doc? Just remind him you're a psychologist. This is the stuff you deal with. And it really led to a healthy discussion amongst the team and just a facilitated process. And you know, I think everybody has kind of a comfort and a style that they feel, but I, I don't think at least my experience in the organizations I'm working with, when you have the support from the president, the GM, the head coach, the coaching staff, and I tell them all, you can sabotage me like that. You can sabotage everything I do like that. So staff education, what is psychology? There's a lot of education that we have to provide, but that also gives us a forum and opens doors. Now with Green Bay, every time I go in, the head coach has me do a, a presentation with the team. And each time after I've done a new presentation, two or three more players come in. And the, but you can't force that. It takes time to do that. And I think um, this concept of the stigma is changing. I think Kenza and Wendy and Scott all made deference. I mean, I think people are now expecting this as a resource. They don't want to be motivated. They don't want to have that extra. They want to have someone who's competent who understands their world, who can listen and, and be trusted for them. So that's, you know, for us trained as psychologists, that's part of kind of how we're trained. The, the way I would, just to add a thought, <clears throat> for me, my discovery between college and the pros is really clarity. I mean, if you help the program be more successful, that's valued. And to Chris's point, you don't really have to oversell your import, all you have to do is be a resource. And I give credit to Mark Aoyagi, who works with the Denver Broncos, because he had this insight that I thought was so spot on. He said, um, what they really seem to want is trust, loyalty, and insight. And the paradox is there's not a lot of trust. <laughs> 
in, in the pro level. There's not a lot of loyalty, though they all talk about it at the pro level because of that instability. But we do have some insight because we have this psychological domain and area of expertise. So I try to be as trustworthy as I can, and the license really helps with clarifying how I can be trustworthy in certain domains. I try to be loyal to the people who I'm of service to, and then I try to provide some intellectual property or insight. You talked about kind of the differences of being a strength coach or an athletic trainer. I think one of the biggest differences is we don't own space or time in our buildings more often than not. Like eight o'clock is when they lift. Yes, we do get some team sessions here and there and we do that, but I'm finding the majority of, of my job is, is really to be of presence and to carve time when we can find it rather than it being dictated like training room recovery days and all of that. And so if you're asking for what's a differentiator between some of the staff, like I remember Hap Davis, who worked with the Canadian Olympics for years, talked about once doing a therapy session underneath a massage table. So while the athlete was getting massaged face down, he was talking to them in that, because that was the time and space. That, and what's interesting was she ended up coming to Arizona. I said, is that a true story? He goes, yeah, it was the only time we could make work for us. So we have to kind of improvise that time, be creative. Any other comments? Really, really quickly, I think one of the differentiators between, in most of my spaces, is I'm a female, mm -hmm. right? And most of the other people that they're working with are men. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really big difference, right? And so I think um, initially going in, I think I was really concerned about how's this going to work, what's this going to look like? Um, but what I found is I, I feel like it's a strength because I, I pull something different from them than other people pull from them. There, there's no real posturing that goes on with me. Now, they still might not want to be vulnerable, but they're more open to being vulnerable with me than they might be with training staff or with a coach, right? Same thing with the coach. The coach might be willing to be more vulnerable talking to me than anywhere else. And so I think that really is um, something that I, it's, a, it's a help. It, it's helped me in, in that space. Um, the other big thing that I was going to say is confidentiality being really clear about confidentiality across the board so that they know that if I'm talking to them, it's not going anywhere. And they know that if I'm talking to a coach, I'm not talking about them because I'm very overly clear about confidentiality all the time so that there can be that development of trust. Okay, all right, good. Yeah, thank you. Yo. You're gonna uh, go on to other questions. One over here. Hi, um, thanks very much for uh, taking time to uh, talk to us about your experiences. Um, I feel like you might have already answered this question a little bit, but I'll still ask it. Um, there seems to be an uptick in uh, some professional players going outside of the organization for resources, whether it's uh, strength conditioning coaches, uh, nutrition specialists, these kinds of things. In, in our field, the, the kind of competition is, or, or might be, uh, you know, motivational speakers, pop psychology gurus, these kinds of individuals. Um, I'm wondering if you've had uh, that experience where perhaps a key player on the team has kind of gone outside for uh, advice or consultation from someone who might not have uh, proper credentials, but um, for whatever reason they have established uh, a relationship with that individual. That is a great question. Um, it is a good question. Um, I have had players when I was at the Bulls that, that have come in that were already working with somebody else prior to coming in. Um, and so I've tried to connect with that, that person. Um, luckily, they've all been clinical people, so we've been able to, to do that. Um, but when I was at James Madison University, I, I, had, I was working with the baseball team, and the coach brought in someone that was, I, I don't know, you know, flashy. Um, even even asked me to take out of my sports psych budget to help bring this person in. For me to pay for, I'm like, what? <laughs> um, I, I didn't pay for it, but um, the, the person came in, did his presentation. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that he, he made one really big mistake, is that we had a player that was um, drafted, and he referenced that player and even referenced things that he did with that player. So I wasn't at the presentation at the time, um, but I got text messages from the player saying, Doc, he's taking credit for this player that you did. and so. Um, it worked out in my favor because it ingratiated me more into the school. 
because now that they saw that this person was just someone that was just a flash in the pants, did not actually know what he was doing, and didn't have the credentials, so they started looking into it. So it became, they started making a, a law, or, or a law, a precedent that you could not come into the university without having X, Y, and Z. So it worked into my favor for that happening. Um, but I know it does happen a lot, and it can be very, very you know, disconcerting when you're the person doing the work and someone else is coming in um, because they can present in a certain way and look as if they can actually help the athlete. Um, but you're making those relationships and you're making those connections and you're making that pathway. So if that does happen, I would just say just you know, stay the course. What, what I would add to it, for me it's very jarring and, and, and unsettling, but you also get a real sense of everybody else that's in the building too because anyone can be replaced like there is no job security like the starting left guard can be replaced at any given moment and at any given time for any given reason so there there's such a sense of instability that it, it can ping one's own insecurity and i know i i personally have that challenge all the time i'm like oh man this could be the last day i'm here and so when someone new comes in who is dynamic or flashy or whatever phrase we want to give it you have this kind of like good grief, Charlie Brown kind of moment, at least I do. And then I go, wait a minute, maybe they can help us win. And if they can help us win, let's see how we can collaborate, which is really hard to do sometimes because they definitely want to take your starting spot sometimes, more often than not. And, and I think the other part, and this is probably because of my own training, I really believe in simple and deep. Like I'd rather go a mile deep and an inch wide than an inch deep, a mile wide, because I like to process. Well, sometimes the league, in the way it's set up, like we sprint from Sunday to Sunday to Sunday, unless you got a Thursday game, right? But we sprint. And so what's interesting is sometimes the flash, because they come up with a meme, like, like <laughs> to me, it's always like a red flag when something rhymes or when they have like an alliteration of letters or something, you know? It's like the seven secrets of successful dominating the days of whatever the case may be. Like, and, and I'm going, it's amazing how coaches and, and players will jump on that stuff. Like they love, like hard, you know, hard times don't last. Hard people do. Like we we, we hear that and we and, and it's great because we can say, all right, we got that thirty second sound bite and now we can move on. And, and so, the only thing that I've done because both teams or all the teams that I've worked with, it all it seems to come in a lot, is um, I, I've I've watched how it how it's come and how it's gone. And so I can kind of just sit and, and watch it kind of come and go because it, it doesn't seem, the, the, the substance seems to not be there sometimes, I guess is how I'd phrase it. Oh, yeah, yeah. In our organization, we, I don't have that problem. We don't have that problem because I, I'm the one who makes the decision on <laughs> if there are any gurus That's awesome. and any motivational speakers come in. So I'm a committee of one. So we don't have that problem. It's nice oh, to have over that. here. Thank you. I was just wondering if you four or five could speak to kind of the benefits of being in-house versus consulting and where you might see that trend going on in the future as more teams and leagues become more open and committed uh, to having these services involved. When I, when I started my career as at Washington State University full-time in athletics, I was one of four people in the country back in 1991 in, a, in Division One, mm -hmm. um, I'm convinced that every professional football, baseball, basketball organization could employ a full-time director of psychological services without question. And we would be talking departments and staff instead of one person who has so many days. My problem is that if, if I'm there part-time, I'm trying to do full-time job. Mm -hmm. And you know, you get, how do you get feedback? Well, if I'm in Green Bay, two weeks in a row and then I'm, in, I'm not there two weeks, uh, the person next to me in the office says, guys keep coming by and asking when you're coming back. I think that's a good thing because I haven't loaned any money or anything. So um, I think it's a good thing to have that. You do the best model that they're ready for, but every model you build, I think, and I think we should be looking as a field to move us to that point. Because that's what strength and conditioning, now sports nutrition is big uh, full-time, you know, multiple staff providers. And, um, you know, to me, that's the, the movement in the future. But because of these issues about poaching and people coming in and gimmicks and that kind of stuff, I think it's a little bit of murky water 
Um, but there's no question in mind with either of these organizations I work with, I could, I could do it full time. Good thing is I have an office in both. So I have an identified office name on the door. I think that gives you a little bit of stability. Because a lot of times these professional athletes are waiting to see, is this just a fad? Mm -hmm. Are they just coming in real quick, you know? Year eight with an organization I feel pretty, pretty stable. They extended me another year. Um, and then, you know, Green Bay has a three-year plan. So we're going to take our time doing that. But um, players will be hesitant. They'll wait and they'll see, is this going to be legit? Is this going to be continued? Um, is this a resource for the future? I absolutely think that, that the teams could employ somebody full-time as a person who works in contract capacities. Um, I have to say that I enjoy that too because it allows me to tap into different leagues and I like that variety of experience. Um, certainly there are some days where I feel like I could be at one place for a month, you know, um, but it's fortunately worked out for me that I can flex and do things as needed, so that's helpful. But um, demonstrating the commitment to it by having a full-time position, I think that's hopefully the direction in which we're moving. Um, but I think you can make it work, and I think having somebody there more often during the season, because the off-season can be really quiet, depending on whether or not the players are still in town or if they go away. And so you could be really, really um, – busy planning and doing policies and programming and stuff like that for the next season, but you might not have a lot of direct contact with athletes during the offseason, depending on where they live and where their home base is. So um, I think there's a way to make many different models work. Full-time might be ideal, but I, I do enjoy the contract pieces. I would take your question and slightly shift it. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm very fortunate. I have this wonderful friend and colleague who works with the Chicago Bulls. And when I, I, I don't want to name her, I'd like to keep some you know, respect for confidentiality. She's fantastic at what she does. When I was trying to figure out what the heck I was doing, I was calling her, I think, almost every other day, like, what do I do about this? And what do I do about this? And she's like, just relax and, and you know, breathe and keep going forward. Mm -hmm. And one of the statements that she made that I, I, I think I have tattooed on my calf now, because I'm like, that's good stuff. And she said, you can earn a week's worth of paycheck in a 15-minute conversation. And so I think what we do is really based on the quality, not the quantity. So whether you're embedded or you're a consultant, the real trick is being there for the moment of the conversation. So where that kind of actualized, just to give you a specific example, first week I was with Miami, week one was Miami week. I did absolutely nothing all week. I was like, oh man, is this gonna work? Because they were undefeated, like there are no problems when <laughs> we're going into week one. Like everybody's like, we got this and this is our year. And so I'm going, oh man, like I'm not serving much of a utility. And then the game started and lightning storms hit. And I don't know how many people here are Miami Dolphin fans, but it, we had two major delays. It became the longest game in the history of the NFL. And all of a sudden they go, Doc, what do we do? Like, do we shut them down? Do we keep them activated? Do we take off their gear? How do we do? And, and so I kind of like tapped into some of the Olympic experience that I've had. And I said, well, you know, like runners and swimmers do multiple heats. And so I think the literature and everything else would suggest that we should deactivate them and then reactivate them and deactivate because we didn't know how long it was going to be. And so they really liked that. And they're like, well, what kinds of ways do we get them activated? So we ended up also picking a particular song as they were leaving the locker room to kind of get them activated again with some music and some sound. And they liked that. And then, um, and then the other thing that was really interesting after the second delay, we ran out of food and water. And so we became kind of like a cruise ship. Like you hear those disaster cruise ships where it's like, what do we, you know, there's 53 guys in the, in the locker room plus coach and everybody else. And, and you know, and, and the afternoon games were already like finishing and we still had the second half to play. And it was a doc, what do we do kind of, it, and I went, gosh, you know, 15 minutes, I think I earned my paycheck this week. So I don't know if being embedded gives you more of those opportunities to be there when it happens. Because they'll move with or without you. They'll, the train keeps moving. And, and so um, I think it, one advantage of being embedded is you're there more often. But I think if you're wise like Kenza, you're super strategic of when to be there to maximize it. Right, look, we have no question here. We'll try to keep our answers brief and see if we get everybody in. Harold Shinetsky from uh, Tampa St. Pete. Just wanted to follow up on the accessibility and visibility. I was always taught that while I'm assessing my athlete, my athlete's assessing me. And so being able to have normal face time with everybody, whether it's a team presentation to normalize that I'm there for you, but also the idea of having micro sessions 
So being at the facility, being able to be on the pitch or on the field in the locker room and just being able to speak to them about whatever's personal, whether it's that at that time or later on, sending like a text message, letting them know that you were paying attention. How, how does that come across for you in terms of making that relationship? I think it's very important. I mean, I, I think those micro sessions that you talked about are really good and even being there not for a session, but just being there so that they see you at a training camp practice or they see you at a meeting or they see, they see you at the game, right? Like, I mean, I don't go on the sideline, I don't go on the, on the field for the NFL games, but for my WNBA games, like I'm right there, they see me, right? And, and they, they notice and they comment on that and they'll ask if you come to the game, you know? So I think any way you can build a relationship um, really is helpful and a relationship beyond just sessions and something's going wrong, but like just a relationship person to person that goes a long way. I mean, remembering somebody's birthday, asking about their kids, asking about how was it when your family came to town this weekend, because I know they were in town. Like, that goes a very long way, and it's vital to developing a, a relationship. But you, got, but you got to understand the culture, too, mm -hmm. because visibility can be intrusive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this. so I was in Green Bay Thursday, yesterday, flew in, then I fly out to Detroit tomorrow. I'll see you there. See you there. Um, <laughs> and then go back with them. So my office is kind of around the corner, and I was sitting in my office doing some project stuff for about an hour, nothing. So I just walked up and I went down to, to wait in the weight room. Guys are doing a lift. Now I know I don't go into the weight room because my jovial nature wants to go chat. Well, that's not where you go chat. That's not where there's cell phones, nothing. You learn, and they're very good about giving you and you ask those questions, but just standing where they came out, six guys. Five, you know, three five-minute chats just because I was standing there with my coffee. But you can also be in a situation where you're kind of intrusive or maybe you're in someone's ground that you shouldn't be in. And that's part of understanding the system and, and that's part of kind of your diligence about entering a system, knowing who are your advocates, who are your allies, where do I sit on the bus, which seat do I get on the plane? You know, those types of things are part of just navigating a, a systemic process when you work in sports so that if any of you watch the office you remember the fire guy right when Ryan burned his pita and he would have called him the fire guy you don't want to be the fire guy um, so it's it's really yes I think those those moments are touch points right but um, and I also think the visibility is important to validate your role so that they do feel more comfortable when they come in but you have to you can't just wait in there without knowing the good places, the training room, all those, all those kinds of things, you gotta understand that first. That's just be cautious. cautious. All right, we got two more questions. I wanna honor these people because they're standing here. So one yes, Chris. Thank you for your time and expertise, first of all. Um, I was wondering if you can provide some insights or experiences about creating an athlete-led support or mentor group, because I'm working at a clinic where we have a bunch of ambassadors, professional athletes, and I think it'd be really cool to have them involved with the community and pair them up with youth athletes and ha have them run it themselves for the most part, from me just intervening on the side, perhaps, but. Well, let me ask you, uh, do it 30, just take a, a bit Major League Baseball. That happens naturally. Our veteran players, under, under our structure, provide support, mentorship to our younger players, not only at the, tr at the Major League level, but triple, all the way down to our Dominican Academy. That happens because that's part of a culture, so it's not forced and it's something that the old, the uh, veteran players see as their responsibility to do that. So, any other comments? Any other comments on this? I, I don't see that. I'm, and I've, I was actually interested to see what answers them, just because, maybe because my athletes are really young, um, but again, our oldest is 28, so that would be something great if we could have that happen in our, in our culture. Um, but it, I, again, I don't really don't see that with our team. Um, just trying to help them develop that, trying to, again, going back to help them to figure out what it is that they know, what they don't know about life, so then they can actually be in that, that space. So maybe um, the question is to how to implement that. Right, and that's, what, and that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, I don't see that in my, I don't see that with the, my organization right now. I think, but also think part of that is the NBA is a player-run league. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really hard to get players to do anything that's not beneficial. And, well, let me take that back. In my experience, what I've seen not just with the Bulls, but with other teams, it's hard to get players to do anything in the NBA that is not beneficial for themselves. 
But my kid, don't, don't do anything that's artificial. Make it real that fits into the context. Don't force an intervention on anyone. One more question here. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing your experiences. I'll, um, this is an old but a controversial question. I don't want it to be. But we've got a young of aspiring uh, practitioners here. <coughs> now, from your experiences working with the organizations you work with, do you need to have a bunch of clinical letters after your name, or is PhD in exercise science going to be uh, uh, useful? You have to have people who are qualified to do what they can do, practice within the bounds of their competence. And, and those competence are mental skills, life skills, and mental health. So what, they, they need to have the competence, the qu qu credentials in order to do that. Thank you. The two buildings yes. that I'm in, yes. And the roles that I've had, being a, a licensed psychologist was a requirement of the position. So the, the idea was that they wanted a PhD psyche in clinical or counseling psych, but they wanted that training in sports psych, not someone who reads Sports Illustrated, but someone who <laughs> has been trained to have a toolbox of mental skills, but is licensed as a psychologist because of the role of coordinating their mental health care as well as the performance area. So it's been a, a requirement in the positions I've been. And I think, you know, it's, it's a great question because young professionals, we were all there, you know, it's all very exciting. and. You kind of want to go out, but this is the elite level of sport. Mm -hmm. These are the best of the best athletes in the world. Um, you know, this is a challenge in Division One athletics, where coaches are given the opportunity to work with students, but they're not being evaluated on mentoring students. They want resources that have expertise and skill. And at professor, yeah. Well, there's a lot of wordplay in our profession. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wordplay, and, and to me, it's about something we could do a whole session on is liability and coverage. This is a litigious society, and you are working with multi-million dollar clients. And if you don't have coverage, you're at risk. So you, because what is what we do, and how do we do it? I, I pray it never happens. I said it in my Coleman Griffith in 2015. I hope it never happens. but. I get scared about that. And I, I would echo that when I said earlier that the positions that I have, they wanted a clinician, they, at, whether it was doctorate level or master's level, but a, somebody who had a mental health licensed and was licensed to practice in that state. Um, and as Chris mentioned, if you work in different states, being licensed to practice in the state in which the athletes are located, because that's legally what you have to do. And so that's really, I mean, it's, it is really important for, because we're talking about sport, but at the end of the day, this is a business. Mm -hmm. And they want qualified, trained people in their business um, so that they can justify why they have you there, right? And so having, having a mental health license um, and, and the leagues are being educated about what CMPC is so that they can distinguish between the, the flash and, and shine people who might be life coaches and not have those qualifications and somebody who actually has a CMPC. So that education is happening. But being able to be qualified, licensed, credentialed, having the skills, the competence, the knowledge to do the job that you're being asked to do, that's, that's mandatory. Just to make it unanimous, all the positions I've had as well, that was part of the requirement as well. That, that you need to have the clinical degree and the license. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We, we, have, we have to stop. I had it cut short some of the questions. I apologize for that. Uh, appreciate your attendance, your participation. Thank, like you. thank you. Thank you.